بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله القدير الأكبر المالك الحكيم الذي خلق كل شيء وقدر وخلق الأرض والسماوات وما بينهما وبحكمته دبر أحمده على أن قسم المخلوقات على تبقات وجعل أفضلها البشر وأشكره على أنهم كرهم بشريف القطاب وسهل لهم بطريق الصواب ويسر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له لا دافع لما أراد ولا مانع لما شاء من نفع أو ضرر وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله تبارك وتعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ما أضاءت الشمس ونور القمر أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم وفي حديث النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كما نقل في الشمائل المحمدية للإمام الترمذي رحمه الله تعالى قال أن ثابت رحمه الله قال أخرج إلينا أنس بن مالك رضي الله تعالى عنه قدح خشب غليظا مضببا بحديد فقال يا ثابت هذا قدح رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بلغ العلا بكماله كشف الدجا بجماله بلغ العلا بكماله كشف الدجا بجماله حسنت جميع خصاله صلوا عليه وآله تمناو مي مي الجايا گيا هون كيلوني ديكر بهلايا گيا هون تمناو مي مي الجايا گيا هون كيلوني ديكر بهلايا گيا هون میرے آنے کا مقصد ان سے پوچھئے میں آیا نہیں ہوں لایا گیا ہوں دی ریسپیکٹڈ لسنرز آنرابل مینٹرز ڈاکٹر اشرف صاحب ڈاکٹر محمود صاحب خوست حضرت مولانا حنیف صاحب اینڈ مائی سسٹرز اینڈ مدرز لسننگ پر ہیپ سیلس ویئر Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. After praising the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sending salutations on His beloved Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and reciting a few words of poetry which we'll come back to in a few moments, I'd like to begin with three quick things before we get on to our subject matter. A thanks, an apology, and a small dua. <coughs> Thanks to Hazrat Mawla Hanif Sab, primarily for this invitation to Dr. Mahmoud Sab, who, as a Scot say, stuck me in it. I thought I'd maybe come to London if I received an invitation for the Christmas party at number 10. But Dr. Sab, I think they cancelled that this year. <laughs> They're having it in private. They're having it in private, you know. So, since that invitation never arrived, Alhamdulillah, I have the honor of sitting before you. My apology is, if I sound a bit jet-lagged, I flew in from Jordan yesterday. So forgive me if, um, if I say anything abrupt. That's just my excuse for being Scottish because they call it the land of the brave. But as Dr. Mahmoud Saab will tell you, there's a fine line between bravery and stupidity. And finally, my dua, which actually ties in nicely with the title of today's gathering here in London. 
a time for thought, action and change. Before this small dua, when I left Jordan, one of the last scholars I met was Sheikh Nu Hamim Keller. We don't have time to go into biographies. The ulama, inshallah, will explain afterwards. So as I walked with my satis down the steps in Amman, in Masjid Bushra, Sheikh Nu, he gave me a very nice lesson from none other than Sultan al Arifin Bayezid Bastami Rahmatullah Ali. They gave him the title Sultan al Arifin, the leaders of those who obtained the ma'rifah, the recognition of Allah Ta'ala for a reason. He, he born and lived and died just at the turn of the second century Hijri. So Sheikh Nu said to me, okay, addressing me okay, as ulama, and I suppose as even normal beings, Sheikh Bayezid said, Amiltu fil mujahada thalathina sana. That, you know, I tried to learn from Maulana Hanif Saab and practice. I learned from Dr. Mahmoud Saab. I learned from our Hazrat Rahmatullah Ali. I ran from, from all these mashayikh in his time. For 30 years, فَمَا وَجَدْتُ شَيْئًا أَشَدُّ عَلَيَّ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ وَمُطَابَعَتِهِ But the hardest thing I found in my journey in those 30 years was once I've obtained knowledge, was how to see that knowledge as an action in my life. How to correlate directly what we know, what we hear, to actually doing something about it. So my brief dua is very simply, that whatever, as the title suggests, is thought about, whatever is spoken about, whatever is listened to, that Allah Ta'ala give me the ability, as Sheikh Nu advised, to act upon what we hear, and by extension, everybody else. Amin. So with my allocation of, I think, 30 minutes, let's move on to the subject matter. Before the title for this um, gathering was selected, I think one of the, the titles that was thrown at me was Overcoming Challenges in the Modern Era. So I just prepared a couple of points, which hopefully the brothers will appreciate. And we start with a small anecdote from Sheikh Sa'di al-Shirazi, who was a 7th century Persian poet. He was actually more than a poet. But he was known for what I recited at the beginning, Balag al-Ula bi kamalihi. And he is somebody who, again, we don't have time for extended biographies, but has one book known as Bustan, in 2002 by The Guardian was labeled as in the top 100 best books of all time. Now, Dr. Mahoud Saab is probably thinking, since when did The Guardian know what the best books were or weren't? Especially when the British Library alone holds approximately 150 to 200 titles, million, sorry, 150 to 200 million titles, but the reality is he's somebody who is acknowledged by not only Muslims but non-Muslims. So he mentions a small story that I think every single person in this room can probably relate to where his father, as a child, when he was a child, took him to the Eid Mela. He took him to the Eid festival. And during that Eid festival, Sheikh Sa'di, he got lost. Uh, that just triggered a small memory when I came to London many years ago for an interview at KCL, King's College London. The tubes were down. So as a child, it never made sense to me that why wow, you can be in a city, but it still takes you three hours to get to the middle of that city. But I'm sure you brothers will be well versed. Because the reality is, if you get lost in a big place as a child, you get worried. Everybody in this room probably got lost as a child and you think death is upon you. The worst feeling in the world. So Sheikh Saadi, he says that finally I find my father. 
Finally, I found my father. And my father said to me, Why did you let me go? Mera daman kyu chora? Why did you let me, go, let me go? I asked you to hold on to me. Why did you let me go? So he writes himself, Sheikh Saadi, that that day on as a child, I realized that I need to hold on to my elders, not just not to get lost in this world, sorry, in the Eid Mila, in the Eid festival, but I need to hold on to the elders for the rest of my life in order to not get lost in this circus of life. This was the lesson that Sheikh Saadi had taken from, taken from this incident. The issue we have nowadays with technology, with things progressing, you know, you grow up very quickly and like ourselves, myself, Dr. Mahmoud Saab, Dr. Ashraf Saab, you, you may might become a bit out of date. The youngsters, you know, maybe they don't necessarily value the, old, the, the, the value, the things that the elders preach about. So I wanted to just dive slightly into why this may be and how perhaps we can overcome this. So why do we not have value in the methods of the elders, the likes of which Sheikh Saadi, etc. had and were a means of their success? I thought of a very nice example in case the ulama were wondering why I recited the hadith which mentions the cup of the noble beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I wanted to ask a question that in approximately two weeks when we go from 2021 to 2022, 2022, the majority of youngsters will be thinking about what, what is the biggest event in 2022? The World Cup. So my question to everybody in the room is, does anybody, so this biggest event, does anybody know the value of the, the World Cup? Manzat, everybody got the picture in their mind of the World Cup? Yeah, made of gold, two people holding. Does anybody in this room know how much the World Cup is worth? Not in branding rights, just the thing itself. Smart people aren't allowed to answer. Do you know, before I tell you how much the World Cup is worth, let me just briefly tell you about the cup of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Thabit al-Bunani, he mentions, he's a tabi'i, he's from the students of the Sahaba, that the khadim, the khadim of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Anas bin Malik, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, the Sahabi who spent many years in the service of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because that's, you know, in the ways of the elders, if you want to get somewhere in life, you need to do somebody's khidmat. That might be Maulana Hanif Saab, there might be other people, there might be Madaniya Academy. There's a lesson in there. It's not directly related to my point, but the clever amongst you will understand what I'm saying to you. So Hazrat Anas uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he brings forward the cup of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Qadaha khashab, it's made of wood. Ghalidhan, slightly thick wood. Mudabba bi hadid. It's with the wood, in order to close it together, it's got some iron that they've used, so the, the wood essentially stays together. And he says, Faqala ya thabit, O my beloved student, Hada qadahu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the cup of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now you've caught the second point. Let me go back to the first point. The World Cup itself, the 18 karat gold World Cup, in 2018, it was valued roughly between 100, for those that probably have Googled it, between 150,000 to 200,000 dollars. Obviously, the price of gold increases with time. So it may now be worth more than that. But now that you've got Qatar 2022 cup in your head, and now you have Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's cup in your head, let's do a comparison. 
the value of the World Cup, circa 200k USD. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's cup went to Anas bin Malik, then it went to his son, another Ibn Anas, Rahimahullah. Someone decided to sell that cup of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Hazrat Shaykh, Hazrat Mawla Muhammad Zakaria Khandilbi writes, that that cup of Rasulullah went for 800,000 dirhams in that time. Now, I don't like making financial comparisons with Deen. I'm only doing this because I believe I'm in the financial capital of Europe. But just to put it in your head, 800,000 dirhams correlated with the consumer price index of that time in today's time would equate to approximately how much? Not 200,000 that this World Cup we chase, that we're looking forward to, but 20 million US dollars. Whoever bought it was a clever man. He was following the ways of the elders. Why not? The question is why not? Why not pay that amount if you could for the Prophet Sallallahu wooden cup? Because if you look at the Qatar World Cup, you have two people with four hands holding up what? The earth, the globe. But Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was one man and not did he hold up the earth. He held up Rahmatul Lil. He held up the whole, all the world, SubhanAllah. So we move on that even for argument's sake, if one day the World Cup in value and in, 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 in commercial value what equates 20 million pounds because you know we live in a world that if you haven't already realized is very fake currencies can explode they can implode but they say that approximately 1 billion watches the World Cup final or will watch the World Cup final up to about 2 billion Now that's just one World Cup every four years because understand the world. It's there just to give you that excitement. Then it goes for another four year cycle to catch the next person, to catch the next person, to catch the next person. But when it comes to the cup of the beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the characteristics that it stands for, the person that it stands for, that the first person that comes on this ummah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the last one, whether that's going to be trillions, quadrillions, quintillions, decillions, that is how many people will be looking or wanting to look at or following the values of the cup of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You see, the reality is, that it doesn't make a difference how much Qatar spends. They say they have spent 200 billion USD in preparation of this World Cup that you and me are looking forward to. But as the name Qatar suggests, it's from the Arabic, perhaps Qatara drops. It's only ever a small drop when it comes to the comparison of something that you and me had been given from day one what you and me had been given that we perhaps did not value as much as we should have valued. And whether it was Sheikh Sa'di, whether it was Hazrat Sheikh Mullah Muhammad Zakaria Rahmatullahi or whether it be the ulama sitting to my right and perhaps in the audience, these people, they understood that this was the method, these were the things that were going to give Muslim success in this life and the next. And the World Cup itself, they say it's hollow because if it was made of real gold, nobody would be able to pick it up because it's that heavy. But the hollowness inside the real World Cup is there because it only wants, it only wants for you to see the outside enough so it can waste your time. So you're sitting in the masjid talking about Chelsea, Liverpool and everything else. But the hollowness that was inside the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's cup where did that take people? They say, Hazrat Sheikh goes on to mention that 
none other than the Amir al Mu'mineen fil Hadith, one of the greatest muhaddith that this ummah has ever seen, Imam Bukhari rahmatullah alayhi, he drank from that cup. So, the, the summary of this is what Sheikh Sa'di says in that poem that recited before you, Ke hasunat jami'u khisalihi. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's khasail, his characteristics, all of them are amazing. Whether that was the people that in the past had adopted them, whether it's you and me sitting here today, these are the things that should be our number one priority in life. Does it make a difference whether you become different because of it? Whether you have to act strange because of it? Because the world will go through different fashions. It will always pull through different things, something younger for the kids to be attracted to. But the sunnat will never go out of fashion. And these people that manage to understand that, as I recited in the Quranic ayat before you, إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Everybody, person, you ask for this guidance every single day. And Allah pa goes, سِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ You want the path of people that have been bestowed with Allah Ta'ala's favor. And who else can that be if it, not, if it isn't the likes of Imam Bukhari, Hazrat Shaykh, Shaykh Sa'di, and so on and so forth. So, now we're coming towards the end of the presentation. And I'd like to share some advice or just some things that maybe we can act upon. You see, old is not gold, as people would say. Ketena, old is gold. Old is not just gold. Old isn't even platinum. Old is essential. Old is essential. Now, I'm not saying we don't need new ways to try and convey the message. Of course we do. But this attachment with the elders, this need to want to read about their elders, to adopt their characteristics. This is something that is absolutely essential. The Tabi'een, if they never understood that, they would never be Tabi'een because they used to spend their time with the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum. So here are my summary points, my walk away. Not so golden advices, but may Allah accept. This connection with deen, this connection with Qur'an, this connection with the sunnah and the people that resemble that, these things are absolutely essential for me and for everyone. Now where will you find that connection? You'll find it with the ulama, you'll find it with Mawlana Hanif Saab, you'll find it with the masajid, you'll find it in the, dare I say it, the tabligi marakis that some countries now have an issue with. These are the places that you will find what? Why? Because in the words of Imam Malik rahmatullah alayhi, which is quoted at the end of Fadail A'mal in the Risala of Mawlana Ihtishamul Hassan that Hazrat Sheikh has included, that red book that's recited here after Asr, it was recited today, I was watching. It's beside Dr. Mahmoud Saab's right ear, you can see it. Red book, Fadail A'mal. So Hazrat Sheikh rahmatullah alayhi, he, bench, he takes, sorry, Hazrat Mawlana Ihtishamul Hassan. He says that Imam Malik said, That nothing will fix the last person of this ummah, the latter of this ummah, that didn't fix the first person of this ummah, the beginning of the former people in this ummah. So this is something that I want everybody to inshallah walk away with. Point number two, if you already are blessed with that connection, you're already doing some form of khidmat. You have a hobby, you study, you help Hazrat Mawlana Hanif Saab, you're running the school. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. This is a ni'mat from Allah Ta'ala, especially in this day and age. You know, I, I was with Dr. Jamil Saab, dentist, local. He was saying to me, you know, Asman, I'm finding it really hard to juggle my life as a dentist and study these kitabs at the same time with um, IZD. And I said, look, it's always going to be tough because there was never anyone amongst the pious when you read about them who didn't have it tough when they were trying to get there. But you need to try and keep this connection. Now what will happen is if you have that connection, you'll come across trials, you'll have fights, you'll have quarrels. But just remember, shaitan's ultimate aim is always to try and stop the work of deen. So if you have any issues that you can't sort, 
and you're already in the work of Deen, whether it's here or anywhere else, phone Dr. Ashraf Saab, Dr. Mahmoud Saab, they'll take your calls. But make sure you don't let that connection go. And lastly, if you do not have that connection, if you're sitting here listening to my message today, if you don't have this connection, then don't wait. Line up at the end of this jalsa with Maulana Hanif Saab and say to Maulana Hanif Saab, by the way, he's not told me to say this, he's given me one salam since I came in because he was too busy putting out the dastarkhan for you people. He's not told me to say this. Line up and say to Maulana Hanif Saab, I came today and I want to help. How can I offer my services to this ummah? And if Maulana Hanif Saab says, I'm busy, come back tomorrow, you come back tomorrow. If he says he's busy then, then come back tomorrow, come back tomorrow. Come back a hundred days if you need to and tell Maulana Hanif Saab tells you what you need to do in order to be worthy to serve the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because I'll tell you one thing, as mentioned in the hadith of Imam Muslim rahmatullah alayhi, reported by other muhaddithin and likes of Abu Dawood, ke badiru bil a'mal fitanan kaqita illayl al-mudlim that you need to be quick, you need to hasten towards good actions and good deeds because the trials in this ummah, there are going to be plenty of them and they will come upon you like the darkness of the night. You know, whenever we sit with Dr. Mahmoud Saab and try to benefit from his company, ulama, hazard ye ho hai, what do we do? This is now coming in the corner, what do you do? This is what, what you're going to do. These problems that we have in our societies, I don't need to list them, you are well aware of them. Okay? They will come one after another, after another, after another. Because the furthest away we get from the time, the best of times, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the Sahaba, these fitan will be stronger and harder to overcome. And the only thing that's going to help you is your connection with the Ahlullah, with the people of Allah and the places of Allah. So please, my sincere advice to you is that if you're not involved in any work, approach Mawla Hanif Saab and ask him, Hazrat, what can I do for you? You don't need to call him Hazrat, you can call him Mawlana, but please do ask him. And if he sends you away saying you're no use, then neither am I. Come to me, inshallah, together we'll think of something to do together. So, with that, Alhamdulillah, I'd like to bring to a close our Hazrat Mawlana Yusuf Matala Saab, Rahmatullah Ali. He would always be, his sunnah was, he would always be bang on time. Bang on time. So I've actually got one minute. So just, you know, youngsters, what the heck are we doing with our time? I mean, really, sit down one day and write down what you've done, how much time you spent in front of Netflix, you know, talking about the new place to eat out, how much time you spent on social media, you know, this buy, borrow, die mentality. Yeah, you have a purpose in life. The poem that I recited before you, Tamannao me me uljaya gaya hoon, khilaoni dekar behlaya gaya hoon. Okay, you know, the, the poet is saying that, you know, and I've just, just been, you know, I want this, I want that. I've been given one toy after another toy. Because the reality is, is you buy one car, you always want another one. You buy one house, you want another one. You buy one phone, you want another one. Dare I say it? You'll have one girl, you want another one. Mere Anika Maksad in Sibuji asked these people, what's, what's my purpose of being here? I've not come, I've been brought for a purpose. So understand this purpose. Take away the gloominess of your life. It's cloudy today. As Sheikh Sa'di says, Kashafat duja bija malihi. Duja, the gloominess, you know, it's, it goes away with the beloved life and the blessings of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashadu la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.